Today, I want to talk to you about a method that Dr. Grenhout and I have been working on in the statistics department and that we have realized has some applications in biophysics. So this talk will be front loaded with sort of this development of this uh, three theoretical framework. And then the last little bit will be the application part, which is where I really want to hear comments because we're just sort of getting started on that. First, I do want to say thank you. As Dr. Salisbury said, I'm a recipient of the T32 training grant. Um, and I want to say that I appreciate both the literal and opportunity cost involved in supporting me on that. So I wanted to say this grant has allowed me to complete way more projects than I would have otherwise, uh, and also explore some sort of deeper ideas that have led to the talk today. Uh, these projects that I show you now are ongoing. Blue is submitted, orange is actively preparing a manuscript, and purple is a planned project uh, that's deeper explorations of the connections between statistics and biophysics. I want to talk to you today about three of these things, basically a new measure of distance on networks and applications of where that might go in terms of allosteri and correlated motions of biopolymers. I have four main goals for this presentation. The first goal is that you get a very basic understanding of network theory. This is sort of a hot topic right now, and so you may see this showing up across the literature in various fields. And I want to just give you some idea of what people are talking about when they talk about networks and some of the main key terms and metrics that are used on networks. Second, I want to convince you that an idea of clustering on subsets of nodes on networks is important, both in our field and in others. And then I want to convince you that our method is the first to do this in a robust way. And you'll understand more about what that means as the presentation goes on. I also want to give you an intuitive understanding of our method rather than necessarily a mathematical one, so I'm happy to answer the math questions for people who have it. And I'm also going to define my own usage of the term dynamic domain in proteins, and later this picture will have meaning to you. Uh, there are two dynamic domains shown here as I will define them throughout the presentation. So if I've done my job at the end of this talk, you'll understand in depth what all four of these pictures mean. I started out with some questions for you to think about. And I'm going to answer them in a little bit of a roundabout way, but by the end of it, you'll have some answer to all four questions. The first one is about the shortest path distance between two nodes on a network. If you're not familiar, uh, a network is simply circles connected by lines. We call those circles nodes and those lines edges. If I want to measure the shortest path, I literally just count how many steps it takes me to get from one node to another, and I pick the smallest count I can do. So for example here, this is the shortest path distance matrix, which is a common term, for the network that I had up when you were walking in. So let's say I wanted to measure the shortest path distance from threonine two to serine one. Well, I can do this network by eye. I can just look and say, well, if I start counting all the paths, it looks like the shortest I can do is two. Similarly for uh, alanine four and serine one, that one's pretty obvious, it's just a one. This is literally just looking at it and saying what's the shortest path. This is, for large networks, a non-trivial problem solved by Dijkstra's algorithm, something to Google. It's actually how Google Maps finds the uh, shortest path between two endpoints. Also in networks, something that I'll discuss late in the presentation is centrality. So I want to give you an idea of what that means, because I asked you to label which node you thought was most central. There are three primary measurements of centrality, though there are lots more in the literature. These are sort of the basic three. The first is degree centrality. That means pick a node and count how many edges touch it. So for example, serine one has three edges touching it. Its degree is three. Uh, threonine three has four edges touching it. Its degree is four. The next one is closeness. This is where we get a little more abstract. This is the average distance of you to everybody else inverted. So one over your average distance of you to everybody else. Uh, and then between this, this one, the mathematical symbology gets a little confusing. Between this is how many shortest paths you lie on. So here, 3 and 3 actually lies on two shortest paths, but it ties valine on those two paths. So they each get half credit for both of those two shortest paths they lie on to have a betweenness of one. So degree, count your edges. Closeness, on average, what's the inverse of how far I am to everybody else? And between this, how many shortest paths do I lie on, equally distributing if we have ties? Okay. The final thing that will come up is adjacency. This is simply who are my neighbors? So this matrix is called an adjacency matrix. It says that 
Alanine 4 has as a neighbor serine 1. That means that they share an edge. All networks in this presentation will fall under two assumptions. One, that they are undirected. That simply means that our adjacency uh, matrix is symmetric. If this were a directed network, then the adjacency matrix would be asymmetric. This is also an unweighted network, meaning that the values in the adjacency matrix can only be one or zero. I'm not going to assign any special values to edges. So hopefully out of that, you got an idea of shortest path distance, what it means to be central in a few different definitions, and what an adjacency matrix is. Those are the sort of initial things that you need to understand as we move forward in this talk. Now that we have the basics out of the way, I want to talk about why you should care about this presentation overall. This network is the Human Disease Network, published in PNAS in 2007. It has two types of nodes, meaning it is a bipartite network. That's where you have exactly two types of nodes, and you never have connections between nodes of the same types. So here, made bigger and with circles, are diseases, and made small and in very tiny squares, are genes whose mutations are associated with those diseases. So obviously, a gene would never be associated with a gene in this context, so we don't have connections between genes. And a disease would never be associated with a disease in this context. We don't have connections between diseases. If you want to go from one disease to another, you have to pass through a gene. Why does anyone care about this? This network has many types of nodes. There are diseases, and there are subsets of diseases. So here, the dark green, which is unfortunately looking the same as the light green, are cancers, and the light blue is ophthalmological diseases. So let's say I might want to make subclassifications of all the cancers. To do that, you are solving a problem called clustering on subsets. You want to cluster a subset of a network. If I wanted to form subgroups of the ophthalmological, which by eye might be a little obvious to you, it looks like there's something special over here, here, and here. But until now, other than looking at that by eye and saying, hey, it looks like there's something special here, here, and here, there has not been a robust, consistent way to cluster subsets. So this is what is the big takeaway from this presentation. Until now, there's not been a great way to cluster on subsets, and that's the process that I'm going to walk you through. If you have an understanding of network theory, you might say, well, wait a minute, you showed me a shortest path distance matrix. Why don't I just cut out the rows and columns I'm interested in and do some sort of clustering on that? That seems like sort of an obvious solution. So to people who might have that objection, this next slide is for you. Here are two clusterings using the same shortest path distance algorithm on the same network where I selected all diseases. So all of the genes are not selected. I'm just gonna to try to cluster diseases and see what I get. All I've done different between these two things is I changed the order in which I gave the distances to the computer. So the distances are still assigned to the same nodes. These two nodes right here have the same distance in this network as these two. I just changed the order in which I told the computer what the distances are. And you'll notice that just permuting those distances changes the answer. Uh, that's because we have to break ties somehow. So if two things both have shortest path distance two, we've got two pairs with shortest path distance two, I've got to break a tie when I do the clustering. And that tie breaking leads to problems. Notice here that we have one group that got separated out in the second clustering. It was part of the large one group, orange group, and now it's in its own cluster. We also see this in another place where this set that was part of the green group became part of the orange group in the top. And the only difference was I gave the computer the distances in a different order. So the problem that I'm trying to get across is that the way you might think to do this is not robust, not consistent, will not give you the same answer every time. Again, why do we care about this? Yes, I can form subclasses of diseases on this network. Okay. You might also use this to predict things in sociology. So this is a network showing Boston residents uh, around 2008. If they have an edge between them, that means that they were both involved in some type of crime. And the red nodes are gunshot victims. It appears by eye that there's some cluster of gunshot victims. If we could robustly find those clusters and then figure out what the similarities of those nodes are, maybe we could predict who the next gunshot victim will be and stop it from happening. The idea is clustering on subsets though. We have a selection 
on the network that is not the whole network, and we want to make a cluster. You might also use this in other health cases if you have obese, obese overweight, and underweight people. Uh, shown here, colored by weight and shapes represent gender. It looks like that there are clusters on this network. And the authors of this paper picked those clusters by looking at it and saying it looks like there are groups here. Is the only way to do this by eye? Until now, yes. One more example. We might use this in Netflix. Here are a couple movie fans. It looks like by eye that movie fans fall into clusters. So maybe on Netflix, we could use this to predict what other people in these clusters might like. Again, the point I want to get across is clustering on subsets. I have selected some subset of the network that's not the whole network, and I want to make clusters on that. I want to form groups that have common traits. Uh, on this one, for all the graphs that I made I'm going to show you, I use something called fruchtman rheingold which is I assign a repulsive force between every two nodes, and then I assign a um, force constant to every edge, and then I minimize the overall energy of the graph. Okay, so it's the yeah, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a If you made a new graph, you lose the information on the rest of the network. Uh, so this is a great question. If on the uh, disease network, for example, I just took out all the diseases and said, well, I'll replace all the genes with edges, I lose information. Some diseases might have shared more than one gene, and I lose that unless I come up with something creative and waiting. The point is, if you make subgraphs, you lose the information in the rest of the graph, and we want to avoid that. That's a good question. So now I'm going to talk to you about how this method works intuitively. This is a network that I made up. We're going to have two sets here, the white nodes and the non-white nodes. The non-white nodes are my selected subset. These might be people who are infected with some disease. These might be people who all like the movie Love Actually. There's just some in common trait that we've used to select them all. My goal in this figure is to measure the distance between node 4 and node 9. Here's the intuition, and then I'll show you what all these arrows mean. If I'm in a community, I have a lot of people in my community, and someone shoves me out of it, I shouldn't have to wander around very much or look very hard to find my community again. So this is all based on the notion of if I really am in a tight community, someone knocks me out of it, it will be really easy for me to get back to my community. If it turns out I'm not in the community, it'll be really hard for me to get back to my community. So that's the intuition to keep in mind. Here's the uh, process. If we start on node four, we're going to pretend that there's a person standing there and we're going to shove them off randomly onto one of the neighboring nodes. In this example, the random shove happened to node 5. That person will now take a random walk on the graph until they hit another member of the subset. So this was extended, um, or sort of exaggerated, just as an example. This person wanders around. They keep hitting white nodes, not our subset. White nodes, white nodes, white nodes, until they finally hit node 13. Huzzah, a member of our subset. We now stop wondering. And we measure the distance from the place where we landed to our target. So now I'm going to measure the shortest path distance, which is just 2, from 13 to 9. I will repeat this random walk process many, many times and calculate the expected distance of that red path there. And I will call the distance between 4 and 9 the expected distance of S, the red path, after taking many, many random walks. I want to pause here and make sure you understand. This is the key part of the presentation that you'll get lost if you don't understand this part. Yes? Can you always get pushed to five when you get pushed to a random spot before each walk? You get pushed to a random spot before each walk. So you could get uh, pushed to nine, in which case you stop and you the distance is one. That's a good question. Another question? Okay. Now, once we have these distances, and I'm going to go through um, this a little quickly because it'll come up later, we can apply whatever our favorite clustering algorithm is. In this presentation, I'm going to use average linkage, which is sort of the simplest, most straightforward uh, method of clustering there is. The reason for this is I want to show you how much information these distances give you. So I'm not going to do anything fancy with my clustering. I'm just going to use average linkage. And then I will have to pick a cutoff place on my um, dendrogram. This graph on the right is called the dendrogram. It looks like a tree. We pick a cut point, and then we assign the clusters based on that. 
that will come up more later if you're confused on questions. For those listening to the recording, we're pausing to make sure people eat food. A natural question at this point is, doesn't taking a lot of random walks take a long time? This seems very computationally intensive. We're not actually going to do these random walks. We're going to calculate the expected distance in a closed form. So there is a mathematical closed form for this. Now, that mathematical closed form takes a long time, so I'm not going to show it to you unless you're really interested at the end. Instead, what I'm going to do is concentrate on the intuition. So here's an example. We're going to do an example real fast. We're going to say that all of the uh, nodes that fall in that blue circle are our active subset. And we're going to pretend that there's a really fine grid basically here, and all of these nodes are points on the grid. Okay? All of the nodes in the blue circle are part of our active subset, our infected people, our fans of love actually, or whatever. We're also going to make these two nodes part of our active subset. So now we'll go through the example. We'll start on this node here. And we will wonder until we hit someone else in our subset. Bam, we've hit someone else. So if you want to be fancy, you would say we wonder through um, S complement. If S is your subset, you wonder through S complement until you hit another member of S. And then you measure the shortest path distance to your target. Intuitively, you do that a bajillion times and take the average. We don't actually have to do it a bajillion times. We know what the average is. To reinforce this intuition, here is another example where I'm going to show you how this is valuable. We're going to say that our active subset are all the black nodes here that are enlarged. We're also going to say that there are nodes at every intersection of our grid. Those nodes are not active. They are not infected. They are not fans of the killers, whatever. These guys are all the uh, enlarged black nodes. And then also A and B will be members of our subset. We're going to measure the distance between A and B. Right now, we're going to do it. If I perform this method, with none of these nodes here, so all I've got are the enlarged black nodes and A and B, I find that A and B have a distance of 2.55. So keep that number in mind, 2.55. If I add a node at position one, so I activate that node, it has suddenly become a fan of the killers, the distance between A and B changes to 2.53. If I take that node away and I add one at node two, so now it's just A and B, two, and all of the enlarged black nodes, the distance between A and B is now 2.5. Turn off two, turn on three. The distance between A and B is now 2.47. Notice that A and B are drawn closer together as there are active nodes near them. This is because A and B are now more likely part of a community. So you can think of this distance as telling you how likely it is that A and B are in some community together. And because of that, we call this new distance metric community relative distance. It is the only robust measure of distance for subsets of nodes on a network. Okay. This network that I showed you at the beginning actually comes from NMR data in the RCSB database. What I did was I looked at the fluctuations within all reported structures. So PDB, 1K, YJ, I think had 12 structures. I picked one that was a small um, peptide that had a lot of reported structures, so a lot of uh, uncertainty window in that NMR. I looked at the fluctuations of motions, and I made a correlation matrix. Based on that correlation matrix, I said, I'm going to say anything with correlated motion, absolute value greater than 0.3, I'll assign an edge between. So the reason that 3 and 2 and staring 1 don't have an edge attaching them is their correlated motion did not have an absolute value greater than 0.3. Okay. Now let's say I want to perform this analysis that I've told you about on this network. The power is I can select a subset. So this is silly because it's very small, but let's select the polar residues. Okay, now we'll take our random walks. Remember, we really calculate expected value, but for intuition, you can think of it as taking a random walk and we'll get a new distance matrix. So this is the community relative distance matrix. Notice that it's symmetric, we enforce that. Our method actually could give you different numbers because of the difference in numbers of neighbors. So serine three has three neighbors, serine two has two neighbors. So you could in principle get a different distance uh, from serine two to serine one than from serine one to serine two. 
So we pick the minimum and we assign that as their distance. Then we're going to create a hierarchical clustering using average linkage. That really just means I say, okay, who are the closest? Can you tell? Three and two and three and three. So I'll connect them. Now we'll ask, what's the average distance of three and two and three to everyone else? Now in this network, there's only one other node. So it gets placed in its own uh, sort of end of the dendrogram. This is neat, but silly because we had a one third chance of getting it right anyway. Notice we grouped the two three and e's. What's cool about this is these distances have units of residues and that will come up again later. This means uh, sort of in a very intuitive, very abstract sense that if I wanted to get a message from serine one to three and two, you can think of it as on average, I've got to pass through 0.95 residues to get that message. Uh, now that's a little, a little fuzzy, but that's the intuition you should sort of carry around. And then from this, we're gonna cut the dendrogram here. I just picked this point because it seems natural. Uh, this is where arbitrariness comes into the, the method though. We cut the dendrogram and now I have two dynamic domains. One of them is made up by three and two and serine one. Call them dynamic domains because this is based on their correlated motion. It is based on their dynamics. Now, this method needs to work on any subset, all the way from very few nodes to a lot of nodes. Otherwise, we're, we're cheating or being biased in some way. This should work on any subset, not just special ones. And so one special case, the limiting case, is when you activate all the nodes, we call that community detection. And in this case, it's the same process. Let's say I wanted to measure the distance between four and nine. So in the same random walk, if I get shoved off of four onto five, I immediately say, oh, I'm on a member of my subset. I stop, I measure the shortest path distance. I do that a bunch of times. I get a distance matrix and construct a dendrogram. The point of these two slides is just to let you know this will work on any subset from very few to all of them. Okay, so why should you believe that this is important? Why should you ever use this method as opposed to picking it by eye? Sadly, because clustering on subsets has been basically impossible until now, we can only compare to the case where people have done this on whole networks. So I'm going to show you lots of examples where we're comparing to that community detection case where all the, the nodes are active. This is the cortical uh, network of a macaque monkey. The visual cortex is colored blue and the sensory motor cortex is colored green. This was based on an anatomical tracing study. So they picked brain regions and then said, okay, where do the synapses connect? We ran this network through our method and we knew there were two clusters. So we did cheat a little there and we said, can we find two clusters using community relative distance and average linkage? And we do. And we get everything right except for one, which in the original paper, they debate which one it belongs in. So I think we did pretty good. And you might say, well, you cut the dendrogram at a really convenient place, didn't you? you? You picked the place to make sure you were right. Well, I did, but I think you might cut it there too. It looks like there's a clear separation into two groups from that dendrogram. Okay. I wanna come back to those people thinking if they have a little network theory knowledge, I'm still not sure why this is better than the shortest path method. This is a highly connected network. The largest shortest path distance between any two nodes is actually three. So the, this is highly connected. The problem is you run into ties and you've got to break those ties. This table just shows you the shortest path distances and how many times they came up in this network. And then here is a histogram uh, bend at basically the point ones. So we could have been it finer to, show, to even emphasize the point more. We have a much finer understanding of the distances on this network. We don't have the tie problem. Okay. But the power of this is subsets. So let's say we just wanted to look at the visual cortex. We will call all of the nodes in the visual cortex our active subset. So here the larger non-white nodes are our active subset. We'll run our method, make a dendrogram, and cut it into place. Now you might ask, okay, well, did you get it right? We don't know, no one else is doing this. So all we have to compare with is the, com the community detection case. We have to say, did we get those right? And then assume our method extends to the subsets case for now. So here's another community detection case where we have the entire network. This is the cortical network 
of a cat. And the expert labeling says that there are essentially four regions that are color-coded green, yellow, blue, and orange. We run our method, and the important thing is we get four clear clusters. This is, again, a highly connected network, and we do make some mistakes. Sorry, I forgot to put in the, the arrows. Some people were expecting that. We do make some mistakes. But overall, we do pretty good. And this is the place where you say, well, what do you mean pretty good? It looks like you got some wrong. Our method does as well or better as the next most similar method. I'll talk you through this graph. So this graph tells you normalized mutual information. That means I knew the right answer, and I performed a clustering. If I got exactly the right clustering, I get a score of 1. If I get exactly the wrong clustering, I get a score of 0. So 1 is better, 0 is bad, higher is better. We compared this to a method called walk trap, which is also based on random walks and tends to do very well compared to other methods. It does require you to set this T parameter, which is basically how many steps you're willing to take in your random walk. So you can think of it as how long I'm willing to wait, how many steps I'm willing to go out for my starting node. Notice that in the six networks I show you here, we do as well or better than walk trap, the next best method. And this is not just a convenient selection of six. This holds for basically everything we've tried on, where we know what the right answer is, and we compare our method to everyone else's. And we pick the next best. Yeah? So for walk track, why wouldn't T always be included if you wanted to get the true number out of it? So if you wanted to do that, you could um, figure out what's the diameter of your network, which is just the largest pairs, and you could set it as that. But then you're going to wait a while. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a confusing, confusing number. Exactly. Right. Large, we've done some tests on that. So, so far, basic understanding of network theory, that we're the first to do this in a robust way on networks. Hopefully, I've convinced you of that. And hopefully, I've given you an intuitive understanding of our method. But I also promised you applications to biophysics. And luckily, I went through this lots faster than in my practice, so we can spend a lot of time here. Please ask questions. But yep. we're asking questions along the way. Mm -hmm. um, the issue originally was actually the reproducibility of the uh, clustering uh, when you uh, yep. performed it, you know, just the simplifying version. You get the same clustering. Do you, do you reproduce uh, your, you know, irrespective of how you present the data in this network theory? In general, yes. Uh, the full paper that we've submitted has um, a, a figure doing this comparison, so it's a, a wise question to ask, and I, I should have put this in here. We get almost the same every time. Um, in that VIP case where you've got one right in the middle, um, we will sometimes see that one switch. But in general, we get the same clustering. If you do it with shortest path, you see crazy switches that don't make any sense. Uh, so we're not doing perfect, but we're doing a lot better than the next best thing. That's a, a great question. And it does tend to focus on the ones that could go either way. Exactly. Exactly. Other questions? We're going to move into the application side. So if you don't get the theory, this is a good stopping point for questions. OK. Yeah? Um, on the slide, can you show like, the X unknown and the outputs of the A and B together? As you mentioned, the X Yeah, this is a great question. So maybe the right way to say the sentence is the distance tells you the likelihood that A and B are in a community larger than just A and B. Does that make sense? So if I get knocked off of one of them, how long does it take me to find another member of my community? Um, and we've designed this method so that you don't need to specify beforehand what the communities are. So we're sort of going to wander around. And if we hit someone nearby, well, that was probably a community. 
if we hit someone far away, well, that probably wasn't part of a community. That's a good intuitive question. Though. All right. The next few slides show data uh, donated by JJ Xiao, who is here in the audience. Uh, so if you have questions about the system, I may end up telling you to talk to him. He gave me some data on Thrombin, and we like Thrombin because it has some clear regulatory sites. So we have these, this clear subset of our protein. Um, here are some of the important regulatory sites. Keep in mind sort of where they are. That's the, the important piece here. JJ has done simulations of thrombin in various situations, various solvent conditions, things bound to it. What we're going to do is we're going to take the data from our MD simulations and make a correlated motions network. Same thing I did with the NMR data. We're then going to say, I'm going to make a network where every edge represents two residues that had correlated motion absolute value greater than 0.3. Okay? So we build that network. Uh, the colors on here aren't important yet. We build that network. The nodes that I've made larger and have colors are ones that were in one of these regulatory sites. And then what we're going to do is use our method to make clusters on this network. This is a very general overview. I'll give you specific examples. But this is the process. Take a protein that we have clear, expert labeled regulatory subsets, get a correlation matrix, build a network based on those correlated motions, perform our method, and cluster with average linkage. This is wild type thrombin, uh, unbound wild type thrombin in potassium chloride. I think it's 140 millimolar. We ran a simulation. Uh, this is going to be a relative thing. So what you need to notice is sort of where the clusters ended up. So we have this blue cluster that's sort of spread across uh, the protein. We have a more localized red cluster, orange cluster, and then a gray cluster that's also spread across the protein. What you should see from that is these blue residues seem to be engaging in some sort of long-range communication. So we built this dendrogram. I cut it here to have four clusters because visual simplicity, basically. And it looked like a natural place. But the cut isn't the only important thing. Let's think about what this distance means. So residues 273 and 274, which if I remember correctly, are these two. Those joined at distance, it looks like 1.7. That means that they had a distance of 1.7 from each other in the distance matrix. That means if I want to pass a message between residue 273 and 274, on average, I have to pass through 1.7 other residues. This tells you how hard it is to communicate allosterically between two points on a protein. And so we've come to call this allosteric distance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the two that are near each other? <laughs> right. So if you pick any um, pair of two, basically, and you look at where they joined up, that tells you the communication across them. If I start going up the network, so to answer your question, it gets a little harder. If I start going up the network, this now becomes average distance between the groups. So let's imagine this group should be our gray group. So 269, 271 are very close to each other in community relative distance. On average, that group of two um, takes 0.8 residues to get a message from that group of two to residue 270, which should be also sort of close by them. So let's see, the catalytic site, and JJ may have to help me here. The catalytic site is right in here. And then our ion binding pocket is back here. No, this one's rotated? Yeah. Here. Yeah. Oh, that's right. So our ion binding pocket is right here. Okay. And next, we just swapped out our solvent condition. Uh, nothing else changed. So we're going to do it with sodium. The thing you should take away here is we still see that long range communication of the blue residues. But notice this gray group is now stuck by itself. It's no longer communicating with anything over here. And again, you have to pick a place to cut the dendrogram, so maybe you would pick the same distance every time. We can certainly discuss that. I'd appreciate feedback. We'd like to work this into something. The next one is thrombin with thrombin binding optimum. Notice that this localizes the communication even more. We're no longer seeing that one big blue group communicating across two sides of the protein. 
all of our communication is spatially local now. And we can tell this very quickly by looking at uh, our clusters. We can also ask, well, how local? How hard is it to get a message from here to here? We would just look at the distance matrix and say, what's the distance between those two? So again, the power is quickly seeing what our allosteric groups are. And if you look at the distance matrix, which would be kind of large on the screen, if you look at the distance matrix, you can say, OK, to get from residue A to residue B, I have to, on average, pass through this many residues. So you see how hard it is to allosterically get a message from one part of the protein to another. Here are lots of situations. We've got the three I showed you at the top, potassium, sodium, solvent conditions, uh, thrombin binding, aptamer present, and then two disease-associated mutants here, and one mutation that was basically made to sort of understand the allosteric communication of the protein, so it's an appropriate thing. All of these mutations, and JJ will tell me if I'm wrong, but all these mutations were made in the light chain, which is sort of back behind this group right here. Okay, so let's look at these for a second. Let's look at D9K. Notice that this mutation is inspiring some long-range communication between here and here. Those are both gray groups that might be hard for you to see. We've got communication here and here. We've broken up our previously large blue group into other groups. And again, it's a little dependent on where you cut the dendrogram. I'll show you those in a second. E8K, much like the thrombin binding aptamer, localizes spatially our communication. So that's sort of interesting. When thrombin uh, isn't bound to its thrombin binding aptamer, it tends to have delocalized communication. When it's bound, our communication gets localized. Also, this mutation here has a very similar effect. You can compare the groups and see that they're exactly the same. Similarities between these two things? I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. MD simulations. You can also do this with. On a microsecond time scale. You would expect it's moving around to not be correlated. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Other questions? All right. And then finally, the mutation that was made to sort of analyze the communication within the protein, we see causes some long range communication to emerge again that we didn't see in any of the other situations. So notice now this red group is communicating. Whereas before it was the gray group communicating with those residues up here. So you can quickly see how your communication network changes and you get a real measure of allosteric distance that I think may prove to be quite valuable. So just to let you know how much I cheated and how much I lied to you, here are the dendrograms and where I cut them. So it's, uh, it was hard to resolve getting the axes where you could see them and still have space on this. So what I've done is in parentheses are the distances I cut them at, and you can see I changed that. Uh, I basically picked where I thought looked like the most natural separation, but you can disagree with me and then you can see how it would split. In fact, if we split this all at say 2.0, we would see the disruptive systems disrupt even more. These things would break apart into even more clusters. Mm -hmm. If you knew which structural sites uh, were responsible for the enzymatic activity, then yes, definitely. So if we saw one of our sites get broken apart, um, so not falling into the same cluster, then we would expect our enzymatic activity to decrease. Um, and maybe this one, I don't know if it works the other direction. That's something I'd have to think more about. If we saw it grow and communicate more, we might see that enzymatic activity increase because now information about our substrate is getting communicated much faster across the protein. I think it increases thrombin activity. Oh, it inhibits. I mean, actually, that's a 
So the absolute bottom side is as cells that uh, red is from uh, those activity. So it is a inhibitory. So inhibit the activity of the So that actually so makes more sense with my claim, doesn't it? I would assume so based on this uh, example. Yep. This is a great set of questions to ask because that sort of proves the or uh, backs up the claim that I just made. So we see this inhibitive uh, mutation break apart that communicative group. So now instead of one big blue, we've got gray and blue. And we see the same thing with the aptamer. So that sentence is going in the paper. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry? Hmm. Thanks. So hopefully you got out of this basic understanding of network theory, why under uh, looking at subsets is important in general, and how what I mean when I say we're the first to do this in a robust, consistent way. Intuitive understanding of our method, my definition of dynamic domains, which is the, the grouping based on our community relative distances. But there's one more thing for the Apple fans in the audience. Let's say I want to know which residues are central in my communication network. Which ones play the most important roles? And if I were to start making mutation predictions, what mutations would disrupt my communication network? So let's just imagine we have a network where the white nodes are inactive and the colored nodes are active. Uh, these colors represent an initial guess at centrality, but that's not uh, important for this explanation. Just know the colored nodes are active ones, are infected, are correlation greater than 0.3, are killer spans. If we do our random walks both through S complement, so remember if our subset is S, then what I've been telling you, we wander through everything not in our subset until we hit something in it and we measure the distance. And then we also keep track of what happens if instead we wandered in our subset and stopped when we left it, it's all very high level, we can start to gain an understanding of how connections might be forming in this network. And we use that to build what we call a skeleton of the network. So this is all very high level. This is sort of a future work section. We build this skeleton. And what this is telling me is if I want to pass a message from, say, 51 to 75, on average, a good path might be 51 to 42, 42 to 53, 53 to 75. And so from this, I can see that 75 seems very central to my network. And locally, we have other things that are central. So 16 is central relative to 14 and 18, arbitrary numbering on the grid. The, the point is you just understand that we're seeing sort of local centrality. And from that, we have a new measure of centrality that is relative to communities on the network. And we call this community relative centrality. On this final network, darker red nodes are more central, according to this measure. Lighter yellow nodes are less central, oranges in the middle. So something that you should note is that this centrality is relative to these communities. So it looks like this is a community, and we have a node right in the middle. It looks like this is a community, and we have a node right in the middle that's very central. So this sounds like a, a fancy name where maybe I've, I've cheated and just called a, a random abstract idea something cool. Let me show you why this could be important. And again, this is something we, we really just started on. This network represents a pod of dolphins. And edges represent interactions between them. So the dolphins were interacting with each other. We assign an edge. In the wild, this actually happened. And I think it's this guy. One dolphin disappeared. He didn't die. He came back later, uh, is what the literature said. Maybe they're trying to keep us happy. But one dolphin di disappeared, and the pod split into the green and the blue colored nodes. Okay, So we have the dolphin disappear. The rest of them split into the colors. What does that mean? Why is this important? Well, on this network, it looks like this node is very central. If there are two main groups, he is facilitating interactions between them. But 
in the two groups, in the two communities that formed, he would not be very central. This dolphin would in fact be on the edge of this community. These dolphins would be on the edge of their community. So if this method works well, I should not call this guy central. I should call something that's actually central to the individual community central. And we did this, it's exactly what happened. So the yellow nodes are the less central, orange nodes are in the middle, red nodes are more central. This guy that you might just say, well, he looks like he's central, not in a community sense. He is not central to his own community. And we were able to pick that out. Uh, this is uh, something that we're just moving into and really exciting. This may also have implications for Alistair. I'm telling you basically what node is most responsible for local communication. If you mutate that residue, you should disrupt local communication. We've obviously just started on this, so there's no validation of that yet in the biophysics context. Except we don't define how many subcommunities there are. Just define two. Nope. Oh. Well, yeah, so this method, you can think of it as decided there were two, which there were, and picked out who was central to their own communities. And we're seeing that sort of pattern emerge when we're looking at other expertly labeled okay. networks. Uh, so for that, I would turn to one of the original networks uh, or original measured centrality. For your question, betweenness centrality would answer it. So if I started looking at all the shortest paths, this guy would lie on a lot of them and I would call him very central. So to answer that question, there's pre-existing methods. And what about Yep. Yeah, he bothers me too, but what's happening is, and it's hard to see, there's a connection right here. So this guy is all yellow because he doesn't communicate with anyone else. But this one has some measure of communication, so he should be a little darker than this one. Because just if you look at those three, he's sort of central to their communication. Yep. This is actually based directly on the degree from the skeleton. So if I build that skeleton, this centrality is a weighted measure of degree from that network. Um, if you want to ask, is it sort of giving me the same? The answer is no, because you could see right here, this node would have degree two within his subset, and this node would have degree one. And notice we're picking up that there's actually not a lot of difference in that community. So you're not going to get the same answer. That's what you're asking. Okay. Oh, yeah. So we got that guy did get big degree and our big measure of our centrality. Then there's an orange node back here who has sort of high degree but a lower measure. Good questions. Okay, so I want to acknowledge all of the people who have worked on the projects I've talked about here, both in uh, Dr. Salisbury's research group over there and Dr. Bernhardt's research group over here, with me being the highest between this node between them. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. We've got about 10 minutes left on the, the formal time, so happy to entertain more questions. So, yeah. I think this is great. Uh, uh, Dr. Dick did a good job of explaining it too. Thank you. <clears throat> but uh, it, and it sounds like uh, it could be generally applied, uh, uh, particularly to the problem of the correlated motions, which is always kind of hard to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, looking at the structure, looking at the correlated motions. Yeah, they're always <laughs> this is a, a non-understandable uh, thing. This uh, is a oh sorry. So so it could be generalized to any situation where you you've got that, that type of data. Absolutely. Um, I have tried it on MD data and NMR data, but I actually recently and Dr. Bundan doesn't mind bringing this up, but I had a conversation with him about correlated data data from um, an experimental data set that's completely unrelated to MD. But he has correlated motions of basically things within nuclei. Um, and he's looking at their correlated motions. 
you can apply that there and see how the two sides of the, the nucleus, the, the sort of regions he's picked out as important, are communicating with one another. Anything that has correlated motion data, you could apply this to. Yeah. Uh, and the theory off in that, which this, this is really combined a lot of information for, the question is always, for example, in those dis distantly related correlated motions, how do they communicate? Mm -hmm. So sort of early in applying it to the, the biophysics context, but as JJ and I have looked at thrombin systems, we are seeing portions that are correlated that have been um, experimentally predicted as communicating. So let's see if I can remember yeah, our specific back. one. So, so how do you get from saying one blue area to another? You want to know the path? Uh, so that's where the, the centrality measure would sort of come in. We could start to look at that skeleton and see what steps we have to take on average to get from one place to another. Um, this one, the experimental data indicated that these two region, uh, regions would start communicating when you perform this mutation in the, the light chain over here, um, which is also interesting. So the catalytic site is sort of in here. Um, both the experimental literature and our analysis predicts that if you make a mutation over here, you have a effect on the regulatory action. So these are regulatory regions. But to get at your question, we sort of predicted that this region and this region would communicate upon this mutation, and it does. Uh, very early though, I don't have a p-value for you. <laughs> Oh, no, that's interesting. So you could take the actual length of each residue you have to pass through or the shortest path of residues from one place to another and get a, a literal distance to compare to. Right. It makes me a little nervous because now we're taking structural data and setting it right alongside this kinetic data. And so I'm not sure if they... They don't really mean the same thing, and it might confuse someone. But yes, you could make that comparison and say, are these spatially disparate regions communicating in a, a kinetic sense? Yeah, absolutely. And these are simulations. There are a lot of structures out there. Mm -hmm. So how do your simulations compare to that? Um, it's interesting. Yeah. JJ's done a bunch of that. We've, we've done pretty well, as I understand, but he can give you details. Other questions? Okay, I will, for those interested, leave up the closed form. Feel free to ask me questions as you're, you're uh, wandering out. Uh, if you're not interested, then drink beer and eat food and it'll all be fine. <laughs>